Okay. Um, my name is April Rudin, and I'm proud to say that I was recently named um, chair uh, to the HNW, which is the High Net Worth Advisory Board for the Hedge Fund Association. That's a commitment that they've made to the members to be able to provide quality education programs like this, both on a webinar basis, on a live basis, um, and via white papers. You can expect to see lots of information coming from High Net Worth Advisory. Um, in support of hedge fund association, especially with regard to the Jobs Act. As we can see, um, now is a time for us to be able to understand what will be happening for hedge funds, how they can market, and specifically on this webinar, how we can reach ultra high net worth investors and family offices. So with that, I'm pleased to um, be able to um, introduce Anna Shaw Grove, who's joining me today. Um, my firm and myself, a little bit about me, I've been a lifelong marketer for 20 years now. My specialty has been in wealth marketing for the past 10 years, and I've always had a special interest in next-gen technology and the intersection there. Always sort of the geeky techno person. I met Bill Gates 10 times in the 80s, and um, I think that that's part of what defines me in terms of my practice. I've been in business for five years now, and it's the mashup and bringing marketing um, skills and expertise to financial services clients, specifically in the wealth space. I'm excited to have Hannah joining me not only on this webinar today, but she's recently agreed to join us on the High Net Worth Advisory Board. So welcome, Hannah. Thanks, April. It's nice to be here. Uh, a little bit about my background. I spent the first 20 years of my career developing and marketing investment products. Um, from there, I moved into doing primary research with high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals and households, which led to some sub-segment specialties, in particular in the family office space. And I've written uh, 10 books over the last 15 years on different aspects of wealth management, private investors, and family offices. And I see the opportunity for hedge funds now with the passage of the Jobs Act as um, kind of being a melding of the things that I've spent my career doing. So I'm excited about the opportunity and the help that I think we can bring hedge funds. So great. Um, I would say that over the past um, more than a year now, I guess around 15 months since the Jobs Act, has been signed into law by Obama. Uh, hedge fund managers, investment bankers, wealth managers, um, many different people have cornered me at cocktail parties or anywhere just to find out what's going on with the Jobs Act. And people have either taken what I would consider to be sort of an active role to follow the legislation and see what's happening with it or bury their heads in the sand and pretend like it was never going to happen. So. The truth is the JOBS Act was signed into law more than a year ago in April. It's been recently enacted um, by the SEC and it will become effective on September 23rd. So what started out to be a bifurcated law, that is one that was intended to create jobs and alleviate some of the tight credit markets and allow access to credit, access to capital for small businesses, um, which was one of the intentions of the JOBS Act, um, unintentionally lifted the general solicitation ban for private placements. So today we're going to um, now be able to have hedge funds and other investment um, vehicles which were never able to generally solicit, that is, advertise and make themselves known to the, to the general marketplace, are now going to be able to create lots of different activities. Um, also, crowdfunding will have implications for hedge fund managers as families and investors and um, maybe even institutions develop an allocation toward crowdfunding. And we can see some other areas opening up like third-party accreditation portals as the SEC has recommended that the investment be separated um, even further from the investor. Um, the bottom line is now, and what we're going to talk about today, hedge funds can now engage with clients and investors in so many more new and effective ways, and they're going to be able to create much more visibility for themselves in the marketplace. One of the key things you need to know when you're um, thinking about approaching the ultra high network market is that these are people who don't necessarily want to be reached. Um, 
for anyone who's already tried to reach them, um, it's difficult, and that's by design. They've surrounded themselves with buffers, usually comprised of the three uh, communities that I've mentioned on this slide. They've got an inner circle, and that's um, friends, family members, um, distant relatives, could be employees, either a personal assistant type, an estate manager, maybe even an employee in an operating company, but people whose primary role is to protect that individual from unwanted solicitations. Um, the other types of buffers that are around these individuals are single and multifamily offices, um, the, the designated entities that oversee the personal and financial affairs of, of families. Um, and types of advisors that are particularly close, both personally and professionally, to these wealthy individuals. So when you're thinking about marketing to the ultra-affluent and targeting them with specific messages, you really need to be aware of these buffers and take them into consideration as you're building your messaging, because as we'll discuss a little bit later on, they play an influential role in how much information gets through and how that information is acted on. Yeah, so um, let's take a look at what hedge funds are doing today so that we can understand how things will be different in the future. So today, hedge fund marketing is, is mainly based on and uh, reflects how pensions and the institutional model of marketing um, pretty much relying on referral networks, investment consultants, wealth managers to refer business in, um, cap intro, they may have some people on staff who are dedicated to what's called today business development or marketing, but as you'll see later on in this program, that definition is, is really changing. Um, Third-party marketers, and then the tools that are being used today, and the messages are really rather limited. Those would be track record. Many people sell based on their performance um, only, and there are many different um, aspects of messaging that will be available today. Um, hedge fund managers have relied on typically pitch books, um, limited to pitch books, um, that have been approved and sort of follow those pitch books even though they may be complicated for people to follow. Um, they could be also limited partnership communications, the offering documents, pretty technical information that's used to sell to investors. So the disconnect and the opportunity is to be able to break things down to um, a less complicated level rather than just an investment strategy, and to reach directly ultra high net worth and high net worth investors. Yeah, well, I think that's a good point, April, and that is because so much of the process that hedge funds rely on today comes from the institutional and pension marketplace, almost everything is focused around a specific mandate or investment strategy. So the opportunity with the JOBS Act and general solicitation is that it allows hedge funds to broaden the dialogue. Um, so it's no longer just about an offering, but it might also include relevant information about your firm, the principles in the firm, some overarching, you know, guiding principles, philosophies, the culture at place there, which are all ways that people can connect with you and remember you rel relative to a very large and growing um, universe of competitors. Yes, exactly. There's a wide range of funds with a lot of different strategies that are trying to reach a wide range of accredited investors with um, many, you know, different appetites and um, different tastes in terms of investments. So here's another idea of how do we change um, in terms of hedge fund marketing, whereas mainly in the past um, sort of relied on one-to-one -one introductions and what I would call hand-to-hand -hand combat. Today, we have newer and amplified platforms for visibility available to them. Yeah, I think one of the tough things facing hedge funds is that the marketing specialists they hire, and they go by many different names, as April mentioned, it could be a third-party marketer, it could be a cap intro professional, um, it could be an institutional marketer, but most of them are hired for their relationships and for their Rolodex, but by their own admission. You know, they say their networks are finite. Most of them, when they get to a new firm, say their networks are exhausted within less than 12 months. So these employees need other things that fill their pipeline. They need those warm leads um, that April talked about and the visibility that helps create a general predisposition for you, your firm, and your offering. Exactly, Hannah. Um, you know, many times marketing specialists or business development, as we talked about, cap intro, um, by whatever name you want to refer to them, 
Um, they may be hired for their Rolodex, but their particular Rolodex and contacts at one fund with one investment strategy may have no relationship to another fund, and so their ability to leverage that may also be limited, and I think that's an important point as well. But here we are today um, with generalized solicitation, which really gives us the opportunity to do so many different kinds of activities that um, heretofore have not been um, available to hedge funds. So number one, if you think about brand awareness, and that would relate to funds not only taking in money, those that might be closed, but making the marketplace more aware of their brand, what their strategy is, who they are, who the principals might be um, that are running the fund, um, the background of your investment team, let's say. Who are you and what is your strategy and, and how did you arrive at that? And that's a messaging um, exercise. Uh, advertising, which can take many different forms. That could be um, print ads, it could be TV, radio. Um, you know, I've even joked about the Super Bowl, right, being full of hedge fund ads and knocking out Doritos and, and beer. So um, that's definitely going to be something that's um, uh, an available avenue. Um, media relations, that's PR, um, being a source for different publications, both industry publications in general, financial services, say the Wall Street Journal, but then other opportunities for, say, biotech firms to um, align themselves with trade publications, say the AMA Journal or the New England Journal of Medicine, where they might be able to hit people who are closer to their target market and closer to their investment strategies. Websites, digital, social media, something sort of near and dear to my heart. And um, that's the ability to really amplify your message. So again, going back to the one-to-one, -one, hand hand-to-hand combat of one cap intro, you're able to take your messages and amplify them and really reach a global audience for a fraction of the cost. Um, thought leadership in the form of white papers, um, different releases are going to be another um, avenue that's available to hedge fund managers um, and something very effective. Thought leadership will allow you to make your investment strategy known, um, what your, um, how you got to that particular strategy, how effective it is, and to really be able to explain how the principles at your organization or your chief investment officer or even team line up to be able to um, execute on that strategy. And that will lead you to more invitations at conferences, events to speak at, and a closer relationship with high net worth investors than ever before. Um, and then the ability to communicate via newsletters and to curate information that's happening in the marketplace and circulate that among your investors, among your potential investors, among your referral networks, and create more community. Yeah, I mean, and the, the point of all of these activities is to increase your visibility to get people to call you, to become more predisposed to your firm and your offering so that when you have a conversation, it's a warmer, more harmonious conversation than a, you know, the typical cold call. And a lot of these activities are, again, about more than just a single mandate or an investment strategy. They're about the people and the fund and the um, operating company that is part of what they buy when they buy you. Exactly. So it allows for more targeted marketing. And I guess we know that, um, you know, the quote from uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, where the rich are very different from you and me, that in fact the rich are very different from each other. Um, if you take a look at the accredited investor world, from one end of the continuum to another, um, Warren Buffett and Kim Kardashian couldn't be any more different from each other. Yeah, that might be the understatement of the year. Um, the, I mean, the point of this slide is really to show that you know two people who both are considered accredited investors and, and probably hold a number of hedge funds in their personal portfolios are very different when it comes to factors like gender, age, experience, education, sophistication level, you know, they're, they're interested in investing their involvement in the investment process, their sensitivity to fees, you know, how and why they buy. And the more you know about your target market, the easier it becomes to select the activities that make the most sense um, and allow you to get the information your desired investors want in the easiest ways possible. 
But let's take a broader look at the ultra high net worth marketplace because we know it's filled with a lot of people who aren't Kim Kardashian and aren't Warren Buffett. Um, but but it does include people in their 20s and 30s who are heavily influenced by social media and entertainment, um, as well as business owners, people who have significant assets that might not be um, particularly liquid. Um, it includes retirees. Um, it includes widows. Um, people in, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and you've got a mix of people who um, like investments, are highly conversant, do a lot of their own research, and want to be involved in the process. And you've got people who are complete delegators, you know, who only see investing in finance as a means to an end and a way to maintain their lifestyle. And so, again, understanding the range of investor types that fit into the accredited investor community um, and those that will fit best with your particular fund and your strategy is going to make it easier for you to decide which marketing activities you want to uh, take advantage of. I think it's really important for hedge fund managers um, in terms of their takeaway to know that this is certainly not a one-size-fits-all and there are lots of different um, um, formulas that they can come up with and lots of different um, mediums and platforms that they can use to reach each of these individual investors. Yeah, I mean, I love the L.L. Bean um, example, and that is L.L. Bean still sends out catalogs, and you can use that catalog, you know, you can read it on the couch, you can read it in bed, you can throw it into the car, look at it when you're stuck in traffic or you're waiting for a doctor's appointment, and they still have a toll-free number you can use when you want to place an order. But the majority of their business now occurs over a website where you know, if you want, you can log in 24-7, 365, get the same information, maybe even more than what's available in the catalog, and place orders. Um, but at the end of the day, LLB doesn't necessarily care which route you take. They just want to make sure that of all the ways that their potential customers want to buy, they want to be there. And um, so what this slide is showing is the five key channels of communication that ultra high net worth investors rely on to some degree or another when they're making a purchasing decision. Okay. Um, let me talk about them briefly. Um, from left to right, you know, the first is media. And this is any message that goes out through the media. So it could be an advertising, it could be a public relations, it could be just legitimate editorial, um, a mention of um, your firm, your fund, one of the managers, um, a quote. But it's what it's the opinion of the media that is valued by um, the high net worth individual. The second um, channel of communication that is heavily relied on by this group is what we call the referential group. And that is you know, some group of peers, um, associates, friends, and likely those people who occupied the inner circle I talked about before. So people whose opinion matter and who is influential in making that purchasing decision. We've also got primary intermediaries, and those are professionals that ultra high net worth individuals and family offices um, have engaged for specific expertise. So it could be an advisory professional, it could be a legal professional, an accounting professional, a banking professional, but somebody who's aware of that individual's uh, financial situation, investment goals, and personal working style so that they can actually make um, they can help shape and guide those purchase decisions in the way that best suits the individual. And then the last two are largely um, personal in nature. One is the personal research that these individuals conduct. Everybody does a certain amount of research that suits their interest and need for detail um, and specifics. And then the last one is their personal history and experience with um, these types of products. And so all of these things factor in, but to a different degree for each individual, depending on who they are and what motivates them. And so again, understanding who your target market is and understanding the importance of each of these channels of communication will help you get closer to what the right mix of marketing tactics is for you, your fund, and your firm. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, Hannah. As I said, it's not a one-size-fits-all um, uh, type formula here as much as um, some managers might like it to be, but probably the best example that I can think of is um, the influence of a referential group um, via Bernie Madoff. 
So he was a master networker in terms of being able to leverage the referential group and simply use that as a marketing channel, which was to refer people in and apply um, you know, standard marketing techniques like scarcity to really um, have a pent-up demand for access to his fund. So we know the power of referential groups. But for any individual investment and strategy, it's going to be some particular mix of all of these different platforms and channels. So there's plenty of noise out there, as we all know. Um, and the opportunity here is how do you, as a fund, differentiate yourself from the uh, more than 10,000 funds that are out there. Um, so I don't think it's ways like cliché terms, like we uh, uh, maybe generating alpha, or um, we might be using ways to identify and mitigate risk. So these are typical clichés that um, firms have relied on in terms of being able to differentiate their firm or their investment from other investment strategies. But what it really requires in order to create effective marketing is deep down messaging to drill down and figure out what is it about your particular firm, the principles, um, your investment strategy, and how do you use those actual pieces and messages across which platforms to create, to create visibility and to lead to what Hannah was talking about before, wh before which is people who are calling you rather than the hand-to-hand -hand combat of going out to look for potential investors. On that note, you know, there are, again, lots of different platforms that we can talk about here. Uh, corporate websites are, you know, probably something that some of you are familiar with, but um, may not be familiar with um, in terms of your funds. So you've been very limited as to just having a placard or just having some um, stake in the ground, but now you're able to create a corporate website that will allow you to um, roll out who are your principles, what are the things that you believe in, um, what um, are your potential investor um, pools made up of, who are your typical investors. Um, there, your blog perhaps could be attached to this, so lots of different things that you can do in terms of your corporate website and what your um, public facing image looks like. Pitch books and client presentations, something you might be familiar with, but again, we want them to line up. So we have the lather, rinse, and repeat um, messaging here. So your pitch books, your client presentations will line up with those value propositions and those messages that you've created in terms of your website. So that's something that's part of an overall marketing plan, which is something that hedge funds need to do. It's not where you sort of wake up in the morning and decide, we don't have a website, let's go make one. So it's very important to create what those messages are going to be. And as Hannah did sort of a deep dive into, who are your target markets? And then what will your individual mix be in terms of um, marketing activities? And some of the other um, marketing activities you might want to consider are things in the communication space um, that you put out on a regular basis, whether it's you know weekly or monthly market commentary, it's uh, newsletters that go out to your current investors. Um, it, it could be thought leadership pieces that give you a platform to share your unique intellectual capital with a, on a specific topic with a specific market. There's a lot of flexibility around what you can do um, with these types of communications. Um, but it's a great way to share what you know um, with people who are if you do their own research and want to access it and understand the, the value proposition that you bring to the table for them and for their portfolio. Some of the other things you might want to consider are, again, um, kind of leveraging media relations and um, <clears throat> using the other media outlets that are available to you. There are all of the, the obvious retail and financial publications like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, major business publications. But something that um, it's worth thinking about as you begin to narrow um, the group of potential investors that you're interested in is thinking about trade journals, um, both online and print um, publications, where you can um, release information either about your offering or about some unique opinions and intellectual capital that you have to share. It could, they could also be outlets for advertising. 
um, both <coughs> excuse me, digital and print advertising. So there are, in fact, ways to um, get to a very narrow segment of the ultra high net worth population without having to put ads in the Rob Report or Architectural Digest, which will send your message out to a very large audience um, at very high dollar cost, but may not actually put you in front of the people um, and the individuals who are accredited and who can actually get into your fund. Yeah, I'm thinking about here the example of perhaps a renewable energy fund. Um, they can certainly find publications and outlets that are um, more visible and create um, some more visibility around their funds based on that particular passion group or that particular um, group of people. And so targeting those outlets for those funds are of particular importance. The other thing that um, I think point worth making about work with the media is advertising is a message that you um, craft and you pay to place. Public relations is a play on that, but it's a little different. You're releasing specific information and messages that you want to release to the marketplace, but it's up to the media outlets to decide what of it they're going to incorporate into their existing editorial. Um, but the nice thing about the media is that there's a um, there's a patina of objectivity there. Um, so I, a lot of investors will place greater emphasis on having read something favorable about you or your organization than they will if they've seen an ad that has the exact same message because they know the ad was paid for by you. And on a, um, on a comparative basis, media relations can be extremely cost effective and very um, high impact relative to advertising. Yeah, um, just to play off of that point, Hannah, I think it's the um, power of personal branding um, that also plays into um, anyone's marketing plan today. Um, some of you may be more or less familiar with social and digital media channels, but social and digital media channels allow you the ability to um, create powerful messaging at a very, very low cost um, that can be amplified and read by many and millions of different people and not only in your own local market in the US let's say in North America but social media channels allow you to really broadcast and amplify your message globally so um, using Twitter as a platform you may be able to um, you know create particular Twitter streams and Twitter messages that um, play to your particular fund and who your particular target audience might be you can create messaging, you can curate information from among different sources and tweet and retweet information and statistics, let's say, that support your particular investment strategy. You can create LinkedIn profile that will help people understand you and what your um, individual bias might be, what your strategies might be, what your experience might be, and how all of that lines up to um, um, position you for your particular um, fund. And you can also use blogging, which I think is, is really effective and um, um, really important in terms of an overall marketing strategy. Blogging strategy will let you create um, your own thought leadership on a weekly, monthly basis <coughs> and allow you to be able to tell people more about what it is that you're thinking um, as news happens daily or even in a planned way. The other important thing is I know that people are sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do all of this. I'm busy and I don't know how to do all of this and I don't know what to do with all of this. So um, it really is important to create and um, maintain an editorial marketing calendar and an editorial marketing plan and something that really um, is a plan that is in place and created um, through professional advice to help you reach your targeted audience. Um, I have a friend who's a hedge fund manager who couldn't wait to get on Twitter and tell me about all of the um, Twitter followers that he would gathered. And I said to him, no, you don't have a plan. Don't start on Twitter. It's not a place to play around. It's a place where everyone can view you. And he came back and said over the few months that he had started on Twitter, he was proud to tell me about all of the Twitter followers that he had now. And um, I asked him what the source was, and he told me that he was tweeting and retweeting with a friend of his who was a writer for the David Letterman show. 
So it turns out that his um, followers that he was bragging to me about were followers of the David Letterman show. And we all know what percentage of those might be accredited investors, and we know that it's very small. So it's, it's a game of quantity, quality, sorry, versus quantity, and it's a game of, it's not a game, I should say, it's a plan, a marketing plan of doing something in a very targeted way. So even though Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and uh, things may have silly names or feel um, uh, not effective to some of you out there, they really are the best ways of, of communicating your own personal branding, your own messaging, and communicating um, your activities to your audience on an ongoing basis. Yeah, and the last activities that uh, are certainly worth considering in, the, in, the, in a broader mix of marketing are um, conferences and events. Um, conferences are pretty straightforward. It's um, participating in conferences that allow you to um, spread the word about your firm, your principles, and your offering, but also meet the types of people who can either refer business to you or who can actually be clients. And so those are going to be people that, um, you know, events that get you to that referential group, get you to those buffers to the high net worth individuals, get you to family offices, or get you to the individuals themselves. Um, the other thing to think about is hosting client events um, or prospecting events that include clients and um, people that you'd like to um, bring into the fold of your business. Uh, and there are many opportunities for how you can do that. Some of you can do them on your own, you can do them in collaboration with other organizations or other types of professionals that have complementary expertise to yours. So it's really, um, it's, it's a good opportunity to actually get some face time and um, create a, a, a dialogue um, on a more personal level with um, people who can become your limited partners. So that moves us really on to um, special interests of mine in particular, which is the next gen wealth. And um, I don't know about our listeners here today, but I can tell you as a mother of two and master of none, my kids really don't listen to what I tell them. And you can see how seismic of a change that would be for wealth managers. So in fact, 98% of wealth of new wealth inheritors will change their advisor set, and they will change it based on their own value propositions and their own interests. So you need to have very different messaging if you're looking to reach the next gen wealth. And we're sort of at a crossroads right now, and this is a very important slide and something important for each of you to remember. For example, next gen wealth, transparency and authenticity is one of the most important value propositions to them. They've seen what's happened in Wall Street, they've learned about Bernie Madoff, and they're going to be, you know, sure that it doesn't happen to them. So they'll use the internet, they'll use their friends, they'll use any way of vetting um, anything so that they understand exactly how things are made up. Um, no dark pools, no fund of funds, nothing that really is not immediately understood by them is going to be something that will appeal to them in terms of investment. Um, it turns out that for next gen wealth, smaller is better. Um, for baby boomers, they were interested in some of the larger funds. They wanted to um, be where their friends were. Uh, but one of the next gen wealth pro uh, propositions that's really important is the fact that smaller is better and they're able to know the principles and be more familiar with the fund and be more than just a number. That turns out to be something really important. Um, another um, differentiator for next gen wealth is they're all mobile all the time. You know, as we know, more and more smartphones, more and more mobile devices, um, not just with next gen, I want to make that note, um, also just in general in terms of um, the entire population that you're marketing to. So all of the marketing activities that you have, you want to make sure if you're doing videos, website, whatever, that it also plays very well and works very well on mobile. Um, Another value prop of NextGen is doing well by doing good. They're interested in impact investing. They're interested in understanding what the effects might be of something that they do. Um, they want to know more about how things impact people other than themselves, and that's what goes way beyond track record. So they're willing to sacrifice some points in terms of return for doing something that they really believe in. Um, they don't trust suits, as I mentioned before. They may go to their friends 
and ask them about a particular investment or be referred in by a friend more than they would trust, say, a suit or someone who might be their parent's advisor. Um, and don't underestimate, as I mentioned before, the notion of impact and affinity investing. Each of them will have some sort of um, affinity and some passions that they will want to have an allocation towards, and they will want to um, invest and be um, have some kind of um, impact and something that they're able to talk about and in terms of dollar returns and in terms of just overall good socially returns. Um, and they're globally networked. Don't kid yourself. Um, we don't have to have a pen pal anymore. Um, you can have friends in many different countries that are influencing you. And um, again, just it can't be overstated and that's the diminishing value of track record. Track record is not as important as it used to be. Um, not that it's not important at all, but it's not as important as it used to be, and it is only one part of what the message is that your firms can um, come out with and decide what your own particular mix might be. Yeah, so I think at this point, um, you know, if I were a hedge fund, I'd be thinking, okay, how do I put all this together? Um, I know that there is a pool of accredited investors out there but I need to know more about who's in that pool, what the composition is, and who within that pool is the best fit for my organization. And then I need to evaluate each of the tactics that you know, you've shared with us today and figure out which ones are most likely to, re to effectively communicate what's different about my offering, but also then get it to the right constituents. So the purpose of this matrix is really to show that not every activity will reach every accredited investor, but the more you do, the broader your reach will be, and the more cohesive your message will become because it will be repeated in multiple places simultaneously and create that sort of lather, rinse, repeat cycle of marketing and messaging that April talked about. Um, but it's one of the reasons that you need a plan because it's complex and there are a lot of moving parts and it also requires commitment. You know, you can't start a lot of these activities and then just abruptly stop them if somebody calls out sick or, um, or you decide that you would rather channel your um, marketing dollars to something else. Um, once you start a lot of these activities, it's about repetition and consistency that helps you get the results that you're looking for. And I think it also impacts your brand, just to uh, pick up on that point, Hannah. So. People will come to me and begin blogging, let's say, for example, and they'll be very enthusiastic in the beginning and every month write a blog and then they sort of fall off and they forget about it and, and there's one blog in July and another blog in November. And I think it really impacts negatively in terms of that particular fund and those particular individuals. So I think it's very important, again, to have a plan, be committed to the plan and stick to it, which really means that there's business decisions ahead for um, each of you. Um, as we see it, there are really three different choices. One is to sort of maintain the business as usual, what we've been doing um, via cap intro, via um, third-party marketing. Um, you might be thinking to yourselves, oh, all of these activities are very um, expensive. How do we have the budget for that? And the truth is that you can reallocate your budget um, it's a matter of taking whatever your existing budget might be for cap intro or for third-party marketers and reallocating it towards public relations activities or social media or thought leadership white papers or um, print ads, let's say. And um, that's just simply you know, a reallocation of your existing budget. And then, again, we would advise people to you know, invest in their future. That would be you know, the last uh, door here, which would say that there's probably no other dollar that you can spend that will return on your investment like a marketing dollar. So if you can think about marketing dollars as, um, even though they are expense item, as a revenue generator and helping to get your firm in front of the right people at the right time, um, I think that will help you understand how marketing has changed from cap intro to all of these different platforms that we've talked about today. So in anticipation of um, some questions, we put up some of uh, our most frequently asked questions. Yeah, and let's tackle some of these, and then if, if any of, um, of the 
listeners have questions that they'd like to pose to us, feel free to um, enter them using the school bar on the left of your screen. Um, but as April and I have been kind of moving around the industry talking about the marketing opportunity available to hedge funds and private placements, we get these questions over and over and over. Um, and the first one is, you know, if my fund's already closed or my fund's at capacity, why should I do anything differently than what I'm currently doing? Um, and I, again, these are business decisions for you, but one of the things to think about is, you know, if you ever anticipate that the fund will reopen, if you ever believe that there'll be a secondary market for it, if you ever expect to have new offerings, either similar to your existing fund or um, drawing on the unique process and philosophy at your firm um, that is embedded in your closed fund, it would make sense to do some marketing activities that talk about your firm, your principles, and your process so that you're priming the pump for future offerings and you're using the opportunity to, to have a dialogue with accredited investors about who you are, why you do what you do, and why you do it well so that there is pent-up demand. Um, but those activities, rather than um, having a call to action um, to try and drive investors to you, would really be more about um, building brand awareness and enhancing your image among you know, desired target markets. Yeah, so I think that you know, having a mark, all of these things could be potential objections, but the truth is that it's um, something that each of you should consider in your own individual situations and creating an allocation for your budget because, as we said before, there are more than 10,000 funds going to be out there doing some way, shape, or form of general solicitation. And we don't know exactly what it's going to be. Hannah and I are not sitting here with a crystal ball. But I can say this um, with pretty good certainty. Um, that's that the first movers are going to have a first mover advantage here and really be able to create some visibility for themselves. And that, that, are, that is those funds that are already thinking about it and creating a marketing plan during this, this um, sort of waiting period until it um, goes into effect. All right, we've, we've just gotten a couple of questions that are similar to the second and third bullets on the screen, which is the idea that we don't have a marketing budget. We haven't earmarked dollars to do advertising and public relations and conferences, um, or our company is very small. We don't have marketing and salespeople on staff. How is it that we're supposed to undertake all of these activities that you're talking about? And I hope one of the things that you've taken away from um, our overview today is that there are a lot of marketing activities that you can um, incorporate into your daily routine that don't require a lot of um, human resource or capital resource. And there are a lot of activities, particularly in the social media and digital space, that are sh very short dollars but allow you to refine your messages and get them out to very targeted audiences. Um, which kind of brings in this fourth question, which is, doesn't advertising and PR attract the wrong kind of people? And how can I really target my efforts to get to only accredited investors? And the answer is, you can. Um, it's not an exact science, but mar retail marketers have been doing this for years. They do a tremendous amount of uh, data mining and segmentation to understand the demographics and psychographics of who reads certain publications, who acts in a certain way, who is responsive to and influenced by different types of channels of communication and activities. So um, if you spend a little bit of time um, you know, focusing in on who it is you're trying to attract, I guarantee there will be platforms out there that could include digital publications, print publications, um, databases, conferences, events, that will allow you to reach the people you're interested in um, for relatively short dollars. Yeah, and be much more targeted. Um, not to go too far off topic, but I just read something recently about the Weather Channel, that the Weather Channel was using their data mining and their um, analytics to sell advertising space so um, on their channel. So if you saw that there was going to be um, very humid, muggy weather, they would, pr they would go after um, mosquito and bug spray people and talk to them about targeted marketing and ads on the Weather Channel for those particular places that were experiencing those weather conditions. So there's a lot of information out there that can help you target and help you direct your advertising, your marketing, and your social media dollars toward the right um, audience. 
I'm also reminded of a quote from Jason Fried who wrote a book called Rework, which is, marketing is not a department. And so everyone should sort of think of themselves in terms of marketing, and I know that's not as easy for some of you as it is for others, that many of you might be sort of a left brain quantitative analyst types, but um, the truth is that you're able to, um, you know, figure out, once you figure out your messages, you can have some of that uh, cocktail party talk and talk among some of the, your referral networks and even other hedge fund managers, which is a market I think that people um, miss sometimes, um, their, their peer networks. So all in all, I think it's an activity that we need to embrace and work on together as an industry because let's face it, hedge funds don't have the most um, popular um, perception in the, in the uh, marketplace. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an important opportunity for the industry to try and refine how it's viewed um, and how it's portrayed by the media, by the entertainment industry, um, by disgruntled individuals who, who may or may not qualify to invest in the products. And it's, I mean, a big opportunity to, I, I think, help this rising tide lift all boats. Yeah, no, I agree. So I want to just thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope we've answered all of your questions. Thank you to the Hedge Fund Association for hosting this webinar. Thanks to Hannah Shaw Grove for joining me today. And I look forward to um, future events and seeing and meeting you through HFA. Thank you. Th thank you, everyone, for calling in. And we will be sending out a uh, recording as well as a copy of the slides. Have a great day.